Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second of today's webinars from Smart Vision Europe. Uh, my name is Jonathan Quinn, and I'll be uh, doing this webinar. Um, this is one that we do on a regular basis. It's it's quite popular with people, and it deals, of course, with data cleaning in IBM SPSS statistics, as the title slide shows. Um, if you haven't heard of Smart Vision before, if you don't know much about well, I'll introduce this in a moment, but just before we do so, a few FAQs, things that people may, be, may need to be aware of if they haven't joined any of these sessions before, is that we do record these sessions, so you'll be able to listen to them again. Um, you can go on to our website, in fact, and listen to uh, pre-recorded webinars, other webinars that we've done, um, uh, and you'll be able to, uh, listen to listen to those. There's a number of different subjects we do. A regular series covering statistics and using SPSS in different ways. There is a little bit of slideware here that we're using, so we'll uh, email out a link to you so you can download materials after the session has ended. And if you think the session was particularly useful for colleagues who were unable to attend, um, if you can get enough of them together, it may be possible for us to arrange a rerun. We do do that occasionally. The best thing to do is just send us an email, let us ask. Uh, and ask us and, we'll, and we'll, we'll try and do our best to find the time that's convenient for everybody. With regard to asking questions, all the lines are muted, so we ask you to use the chat panel. And if we run out of time, we'll follow up with you offline. We do that on a regular basis. Uh, this webinar is quite a complex one because it's just a lot of different uh, procedures that we need to demonstrate. So I do get a bit distracted from that. I'll try and remember to check the chat panel as we're going along. If you don't know who Smart Vision are, we are a technology provider specializing in SPSS. We're a gold accredited partner to IBM, as well as a company called Predictive Solutions and Data Robot. As I say, we specialize in SPSS, but that includes things like advanced analytics, uh, data science, uh, machine learning, all that type of stuff. Though we do work with open source technologies like R and Python as well. Um, we are a uh, small team of people, but we're all veterans of the analytics industry, uh, the analytics software industry. Um, I think I first started working for SPSS when it, when it still existed in 1995, so that's 29 years ago, and I'd been a user for five years prior to that. So you know, 30 years plus of experience of working with this particular software, but that means, of course, that we are applying this software and other software packages and other uh, analytical applications in many different sectors, whether it be in commercial or, or, or not-for-profit, things like retail or power or water utilities or central government, uh, healthcare, um, media and manufacturing. So we've got pretty deep experience of using this type of technology in many different ways and in many different uh, walks of life. So we're gonna talk about uh, data cleaning here, and we need to talk about why that's an issue, what that constitutes, and how we're going to address it. And of course, data cleaning is an almost universal problem for anybody who works with data. There's always something that needs to be done. And errors and irrelevancies in data come about in a range of different ways. It could be simply when people are inputting data, they will make mistakes occasionally. They're going to put a mis misplaced keystroke. They're going to try to type somebody who's 79 years old and accidentally type 799 years old, you do get inconsistencies in recording information between different data entry operators. The way in which one person inputs or records data is not the same as the way another person does, or they change over time. If you're grabbing historical data, you may find that the way in which something is recorded changes over time. So you get inconsistencies. Uh, you get information collected on non-applicable events or subjects. There's often fields or 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 cases, rows of data, which simply aren't relevant for your analysis and will actually mess up your analysis. So you want to get rid of those. Sometimes it's just mismatches. Uh, often when you're when you're grabbing data from a database, um, you will get joins that, uh, that show data for one group of people, but not for another group of people, or one set of information for another set of information. You'll get duplicates. Um, you'll get uh, irrelevant values. And differences in how various systems in code represent information such as date or time fields. That's a very common issue. Um, all different systems have, have different ways in which they encode uh, time or date. And that can lead that can lead to problems, particularly when you're when you're trying to work with date or time-based data and you and the, the system doesn't recognize it as an actual date field or a time field. You may have to do something to try and fix that. 
And that's part of the, the data cleaning uh, process as well. So typical tasks that people are going to get are going to uh, encounter are things like, well, you might have fields or records where most of the data is missing. So you get a high percentage of what known as missing values or high degree of variability. Or sometimes you get too little variability. I often get data sets to work on where I have a field which has no variability in it whatsoever. It's got the same value all the way through it. So obviously that's no good to me. I might want to get used to that. I might want to get, get rid of that. Uh, correcting values that are the range. As I say, people who are under 99 years old or they have minus numbers when they can't possibly have minus numbers. It doesn't make sense. That's their age. Um, or identifying and removing duplicate records. Ensuring variables are correctly formatted. Um, SPSS statistics has a particular way in which it formats uh, and records data. It's, you can call this metadata. SPSS calls it dictionary information. Identifying whether something is a number or whether it's a category, for example, that type of thing. Um, removing decimal places um, if, if that's not necessary because it's an integer value. Checking that values in combinations of variables don't contradict each other. So you might get, you know, people who say they're, they're they have a driving license, but they're also recorded as being twelve years old or something like that. Um, and also creating syntax to correctly uh, to correct data issues automatically. Sometimes, uh, certainly the 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 work that I'm involved in. It would it would take quite a long time to manually go through and clean everything, and it's often a lot faster to write a piece of syntax which will, for example, fix you know, a range of different fields, a range of different variables in one go, or a lot of cases in one go. And syntax is a very powerful way to do that. We'll be touching on that at the end of the session. Now, in SPSS, most issues with data fall into one or two categories. Data formatting issues can be caused by, of course, how the data were stored in other systems. And you'll often get problems with the data itself where it's caused by human error or syst systematic failures. So we're going to start off talking about formatting issues. These are things like date and time variables, making sure that they are correctly formatted as date and time, uh, identifying values which are non-legitimate. So we would define them as, as missing values, attaching information such as value labels or variable labels that explain what categories mean or explain what the what the field is recording, and then making sure that the variable type, the field type, is 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 correctly encoded. You will get occasionally, well, very often actually, you'll get data being read as what's called character string, as opposed to numeric. So if you're recording somebody's salary, for example, and it comes in as a string field, SPSS can't really do much of that because if it's a string field, it can't take an average on it. It can't you know it can't calculate with it in, in the way that it would if it was a proper number field. And even things like variable names, uh, SPSS has a number of rules associated with how variable names have to be recorded. And if you're reading data from an external system and it's it, you've got a field name, for example, with a space in it, um, it may well rename that, that, that field name. Or if there's a, a, an illegal character, like an asterisk or something like that, it might not know what to do with it. So it'll give it a default name. And then problems with the data itself, so things like actual errors, identifying that's an error that needs to be corrected, irrelevant values, inconsistencies, duplicates, or as I say, illogical relationships. These are these are problems that we're going to deal with in the second part of the demonstration as we work through the data itself. So data formatting problems and problems of the data itself are two separate issues, and we're going to have a look at how we how we address those within SPSS. So I've got a copy of SPSS statistics open here. I think it's uh, version, let's see, uh, it's the latest version is version 29.02. It's not relevant. Uh, I think pretty much everything that I'm demonstrating here will be relevant for uh, versions going back, I think about 10 years or so. So don't be too concerned if it if you see something that looks a little bit different from your own copy. This this should all still apply. Um, the data set that we have open here looks initially like it's a pretty pretty decent data set. It looks like it's been correctly formatted, but in fact it has a plethora of problems that we need to address. And the first thing that my eye is drawn towards is the fact that we have a field here which is labeled var 001 so it turns out that that could come about this this strange naming of a field 
um, through through the original field that I've imported the data from. Maybe it came in from Excel or maybe it came in from a CSV file or a database, something like that. And the original field name may have had something like a space in it. So it could have been two words, or as I say, it could have had an illegal character. SPSS requires field names to not have um, any special characters in them, apart from underscores, really, and sometimes a, a hash. Uh, that's usually a special field name. You can get away with that to a degree. But things like full stops, commas, spaces, slashes, dashes, hyphens, percentage signs, that those are special characters. And what it will do is it will rename the field to a default and it will call the first field that encounters that it, that, it, that it can't come up with a name for var001, meaning variable one uh, and variable two and variable three and variable four as it encounters other field names that it can't resolve correctly within the system. So that's one of the issues that, that we might have to deal with. The other thing is that SPSS likes field names to begin with a letter. So you couldn't call it, you know, um, first, you know, first response or something like that. You couldn't have a one at, at, at the start. You'd have to actually type the word first. As I say, if you do have two words in a field name, a good way to resolve it is to use an underscore between between the uh, between the two words. So in this case, if I just want to fix that, it's, it's pretty easy to do. So you could just double click on it and give it a different name. Here I could call this one. This one's supposed to be called job cat, job category. Um, as I say, if it was if it was actually two different words, I could call it job underscore category. That's a good way around it. Um, it happens to be called job cat. It's a standard one. This is a data set which I work with a lot. You'll see it in, in a lot of the webinars I, de I deal with. Um, it refers to employees in a bank in the US in the 1980s. In the original field is called job cat. You should be aware, however, that if you had a lot of fields like this and you wanted to, to rename them in, in, say, code or something like that, you could go to File, New Syntax here, and you could type in a command. Most most commands in the SPSS are kind of plain English. So if I type in rename, you can see as I type in the word rename here, rename variables comes up. And I could type in like job cat or something like that. And if I can't remember the syntax, sometimes you can't remember exactly what the syntax is. Is it equals? Is it two or something like that? Um, a good way around this is simply to click on uh, a part of the syntax, usually the, the, what we call the keyword at the start, and click on syntax help. Really useful. And it opens up the syntax help that's relevant for that. So you can see here, it'll give you a little example here. Here's job cut, indeed the same field, equals title, which is in parentheses here. So I could... I could rename that field uh, using that command. So I could rename like the job cut. Let's call it um, something like equals job role, something like that, full stop. I put a full stop at the end. And if I want to just run that bit, I can highlight just that bit and say, just run that selection. And it looks like nothing's happened, but but very quietly in the background, it's actually, it's actually renamed uh, job cut to job role. Why is that particularly useful? Well, it could be that you had a whole list of fields over here. So you could have like var001 to var002, var003, and you could assign them all their names, you know, all the correct names in, in the correct order in one big list. And, you know, that's 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 quite a, a good time-saving uh, uh, trick to know about. So that's the first thing there. We've dealt with um, we've dealt with this field here. As I say, you can just jot, you can just double click on them. It'll take you to the variable view, and you can rename them. It's useful to have descriptive names for your for your field headers. You will of course have variable labels. These you can see it says employment category. This is this variable label here, which explains what that uh, what that field is, what that variable is, and that's what's going to appear when I do any sort of analysis. On the field, uh, um, it's it's not going to it's it's going to put that as a title at the top of it. The next thing I encounter is something which is can happen occasionally. This is this refers to the formatting of what's called the level of measurement of the field. So we have a field here next to it called salary, and you can see a field here called sell begin. This is people's beginning salary, the starting salary. This is the current salary. But notice that they have different symbols. This symbol here represents. As you can see, when it pops up, the little pop-up here appears, 
It represents a nominal field. That's its, its measurement level. And that means that SPSS assumes this is a set of categories rather than a series of numbers. So if I did some analysis on it, for example, if I right click the descriptive statistics, you can see that it gives you this kind of nonsensical output here where it's showing percentages. And the way to fix that is to change the level of measurement to something that's more appropriate for that field. Again, you could try double clicking on it. Um, if you uh, if you if you scroll along to the end of the variable view here, you'll see it says level of measurement. That should be a scale field, a scale field sometimes called a continuous or an interval field. If I change that to scale and then rerun my analysis, it treats it appropriately. It says, okay, the mean uh, the mean uh, salary is thirty four thousand dollars. The median salary is this, and you've got three missing values, and this is what standard deviation. It's correcting, it's treating it correctly. Again, you should be aware that in syntax here, if you type in variable, you can see that there's actually a lot of different commands here that come up. Variable attribute, variable labels, variable role, variable width. Um, I use variable width a lot because if you get variable width refers to to the display width. Sometimes you get, sometimes you read in data and everything looks like that. It's just a bit of a pain to constantly go through every, you know, go through one, each one individually. So you could use the variable width command to to set the width for a whole bunch of, of variables. You could say from from variable one effectively to variable two. But here I could, for example, say uh, variable level. Like a variable level, excuse me. And I could put salary, excuse me, type it correctly. You can see it's actually guessing it. Salary and in brackets, I could put make it a different type, a rank order variable. That would be like a rating scale, like a satisfaction scale. Change it to that, run that. And it does the same thing. This time it's changed it to a, a rating scale. It's, that's the sort of symbol you have for something like satisfaction or agreement. I, again, I can just change it back to to the correct level of measurement, which which should be uh, people's uh, uh, pe uh, the data recorded as a scale field rather than as a as a rating scale field, which is which would be appropriate if it if it was salary bands if it was salary bands because it's a it's a ranked group if you like rather than individual values. So that's something to bear in mind. What about things like when we have uh, values which which don't make sense or which seem to fall outside an obvious range. So here we have the variable age. And in the same sense as I ran an analysis on salary by right clicking it, I can right click on variable and the variable age here and do descriptive statistics. And I would notice, I would probably spot right away that the minimum value here is minus nine. Um, that's probably a missing value. That's probably a value that that indicates that we don't know what this person's age is, uh, but it's it's come in as a legitimate value. So we can tell SPSS that this is a non-legitimate value, that this is, a, a, in fact, should be treated as a missing value by, again, double-clicking on the header, this time going to the column marked missing. And when you click on here, you can see that you can have discrete missing values. You can actually have up to three by default, or you can have a range. You could say everything from minus 99 to minus one, for example, if you wanted. The reason why you have three discrete missing values is simply due to the convention in survey research that you have different missing values for non-legitimate responses, such as a value like 99 for don't know, 98 for uh, not applicable, and 97, let's say, for or refused, I should say, refused to answer the question. In this case, I could simply put minus nine. And now that 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 value has been indicated as a missing value. It doesn't get rid of it. You can still see it here in, in the column. But if I right click and do an analysis on it, you can see that now the minimum value is 20 to 62. And it does have an effect upon the mean. You can see now the mean is 34.73 versus Previously, it was 34.45. The minus nine brought the mean down slightly. Again, you should bear in mind that there is syntax for missing values. If you needed to do it to a whole bunch of variables in one go, again, I'm just, you can see I'm typing in missing values here. And I could put, you know, salary or something like that. And again, if, you, if you're not sure what the syntax is, just remember you can click on here. It'll give you a little example. 
of what the missing values. Uh, so you can see missing values here. I can have two for variable one, eight and nine. And then for variable two, three, uh, two and three, I could have a value of zero. So you can do a whole bunch of them, or you could say variable four or variable five to variable nine. So you could do a whole list of them. As long as they're contiguous to each other, you could give them uh, their own missing value. So here I could, uh, if I wanted to just put, you know, salary should have a missing value of, I don't know, minus 99 or something like that, full stop, run that. And then, although it's not necessary in this case, if I went back to salary here, you see that minus $99 has been added as a missing value there. I don't need it in this case, but um, but that's how you do it. So you can do it through syntax as well. So again, remember that syntax is available for pretty much everything that we're doing here. And uh, it, it'll save a lot of time if you've got a big data set. It makes sense to kind of familiarize yourself with the, with the, the, the code commands for, uh, for everything that we're doing here. The next thing we come to is a field called job time. So this is a field. This is meant to record uh, the months since hire. So how many how many months they've been in their job uh, as an employee of the bank? There's a couple of weird things here. First of all, um, it's got x values in there, so it's got these characters of x, um, and presumably they indicate again a missing value of some sort. But because there is an x in there, because it's a, a a, a alphanumeric character it it has read the variable as a uh, presumably from csv files something like that it's read it as a string field what's called a, a character string field and we can see that because it's got a subtle little a next to it for alphanumeric so there's different ways in which you could do deal with that you could actually just double click on it and say right i'm going to force you to be a uh, a numeric field and if I do that, it's obviously got to do something with the x values because they can't be they can't be represented as numbers. If I change that to a numeric field and say, okay, you're a numeric field now. You don't need a width of sixteen for because you know you're not going to have a, a number of sixteen characters in it. So I'll make it a width three. And you can see immediately it's changed. It's also recording it as a nominal field. It, that, why was it a nominal field? Well, because it was character string and character string aren't scale fields. So again, I could double click on here and change that to, to scale. Notice that what was X beforehand now or just a replaced with period symbols and full stops. This, these are known as system missing values. They're the equivalent of nulls within the data. Um, and they're already missing. So they're missing by default. So if I did like descriptive statistics here, I could say, okay, these uh, these missing values here, there's five of them. It's finding five missing values. Presumably those are these these uh, f five occurrence of these, of these full stops. You could sort it in order if you wanted here and just say sort in ascending order. And you'd see there they are at the top there. And if you wanted to go back to the original order, you just click here and sort back in the original order. So their job time. What happens if we... If we decided for whatever reason just to replace all of those values of something like a mean or something like that. So um, we can go to the transform menu here and you can go down to replace missing values. Now, this is an unusual little procedure. It's it's used in conjunction with something called time series analysis. Um, you can see here that the default says series mean. So if I pick up... Um, previous experience of months, or sorry, months since hire, which is job time, and put that in there, it does insist that I give it a new field, a new name. So it won't let me overwrite it. So I'd have to call it job time two, and then click change. And series mean indicates that, you know, as a series of points, it'll take the average in it. Why is, why is it doing that? Well, it's because if it's a time series, um, it's very often a, a kind of fix that if you've got like I don't know, sales, over time or something like that and you want to just basically impute the missing value in that um that you simply say okay i'm going to take the i'm going to take the average of it which is you know which is quite a big assumption to assume that you know i don't know what this person's length of time is in the job so i'm just going to plug in the average at that point note also that if you do have time series data you can actually do the mean of the nearby points on the mean. So if it's an upward trend, for example, you might not want to replace it with the overall mean, but rather the mean of the points that are either side of it 
So this is the series main. I click OK at that point. And it's basically going to plug it, it. It plugs it in. It calls it. It creates a new version of it. Here's job time two, if you like. Um, and I could I could say right, okay, I'm going to delete this old one here. You can see it's it's added decimal places to it. We don't really need those because it's an integer value. So I could say okay, get rid of the decimal places. It's added a weird label to it, S mean, which is uh, probably not appropriate. So I could say um, uh, time. Uh, since hire or something in months or something like time and job uh, in months or something like that I could do that and I've kind of fixed it if I want to move them around I can just click on the header and move it back to where it was beforehand and of course I don't need the number two in the end now I just go back to job time okay so that's one that's one way in which you can replace a whole series of values at the bottom here. I'm scrolling at the bottom because this this uh, I have to remember that this screws up some analysis later on in the uh, in the demo. So I'm just going to delete these because it, it did have some blank rows at the bottom here. I'm going to delete those so it doesn't mess up something else I want to demonstrate further down the line. But there suffice to say there is a way to just simply replace a missing value with the series mean using this transform replace missing values command. It's another common approach, very useful for, for time-based data or trend-based data. Speaking of time-based data, we have another problem here in that we have the field date of birth. And again, you see that this has been recorded as nominal. Why has it been recorded as nominal? Well, because it's come in from a system that uh, that, that has that has printed the date like this. And the SPSS doesn't really know how to represent that data, what to do with it. Uh, so it calls it a string field. Again, we've got this little A symbol indicating that it's a alphanumeric field. What might I do here to try and fix this? This is such a common issue. Um, there is, there's different ways in which you can do it. You, it sometimes it's, it's worth trying this. Uh, and in this case, it does actually work, but it doesn't always work. But what I would recommend doing is, if you're going to try this, is that you could force it to convert it to a date field and see if it works. Okay, Sometimes it just not, doesn't work because it's got characters that SPSS doesn't recognize or some, some sort of separator. But what I would normally do is I would copy it and I would just probably just uh, paste it in there, something like that. You could paste it in there. I don't want, actually didn't want to do that. I didn't want to paste it over the top of a, an initial field. So I'd probably create a little space for it. So I'd say insert blank variable there you go insert blank and then just paste over the top of that you can see here it's calling it var 001 but it's because it doesn't it doesn't doesn't allow you to call it the same name so i could call it you know dob2 and i could try this i could i could say okay let's change the type from string to date okay so and you can see here it tries to match the date up with this with the with these uh various formats it has um, if we go back to it and have a look at it again, you can see that this one actually uses slashes, whereas the format that I'm being offered here has um, has dashes in it. So it has dashes between or hyphens between it. You notice that it has MMM. That indicates, of course, that the month is recorded uh, in three letters. So FEB for Feb or APR for April. And that's how it's been recorded in our data. Will it work if I if I click on this and try to change it to a string field, let's see. Well, sorry, change it to a date field from a from a string field. Well, it turns out it has. It, it's actually, it's even put a little date symbol next to it. I wouldn't call that a nominal field. I would say that's actually closer to a scale field. So it changed that. And it's correctly formatted as a date field. Now, it turns out that the way in which systems like SPSS deal with these types of uh, uh date fields is that is that they record them as a number of seconds elapsed from a point in time. So if I were then to change this to a numeric field, it actually shows it as a really long number. And it's actually the number of seconds elapsed from a point in time. In Excel, uh, this uh, dates are recorded as the number of seconds elapsed since the first of the first 1900. In SAS, it's recorded as, I think, the first of the first 1960. And in SPSS, if you want to find out uh, how dates are recorded, there there is a special wizard that helps you work with date fields. So it's down here. It's called the Date and Time Wizard, another approach to fix awkward date fields. 
you can see it says learn how dates and times are represented in SPSS. And they are represented as the number of seconds since midnight, October 14th, 1582, which is the introduction of Gregorian time. So this isn't arbitrary start point, but that's how it works out a date field. So when I turn it into numeric, that's that's what it's doing. It's, it's showing its number of seconds elapsed since uh, 1582 at that point in time. Um, I did want to point out that um, I can see I'm just hitting Control Z here to go back to the to the previous version and undo that change. But I did want to point out this uh, uh, this date and time wizard because it fixes so many problems. So you, so you might, for example, say create a date or time variable from a string containing a date or time. So that's one way in which you, you can deal with that, where you can say, OK, look, this is it scans the data and it, it allows you to try and match it in this way and said, well, it's closest to that type of match. Sometimes you're going to get date and time variables brought in where you get the day, the month, and the year in separate parts, as separate fields. So you can say, create a date and time variable and indicate which field is the year, which field is the month, which field is the day of month, uh, the day of the month, and it will create a field for you from that. You can calculate dates and times. So you could say, okay, I want to work out somebody's age, say today. So I could say, okay, what's their age today by calculating the number of time units between two dates. So I could say, okay, let's take um, today's date and take, take away the current date of birth and record the answer to me in years. And that would, that would create a field for me called age today. I could click that and hit finish. You see, it's a very useful wizard and tells me what age they would be today in years. So again, stuff that's useful to know about um, uh, in that really useful date and time wizard that you've got to play with here. In this case, uh, we don't actually need we don't actually need it because we got away with simply double clicking on it and changing it to to um, uh, to to a date directly. By, by double clicking on it and just going into the, the uh, format options there. Um, but bear in mind that uh, yet a third way to deal with this is to use uh, more complex syntax. There's a thing called transform compute. Transform compute would allow you, for example, to separate out the days, the months, and the years, and then combine them back together. So there's code that allows you to do that. Generally speaking, I haven't encountered a situation yet where I can't fix a date field in SPSS if it's been read logically uh, and, and into the data set. It might be, it might be that it, it's in a format that SPSS doesn't recognize, but I can usually, you know, separate it out, uh, the different parts of it out as, as a string, and then and then change it, and then uh, kind of weld it back together again to create to create a, 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 the, the correct date field. Okay. So these are all issues that we've been dealing with thus far with the um, with uh, with the data formatting, but problems with the data itself is the kind of second part of the issue that we're going to the, the second part of the problems we're going to come to. We've got a field here when you're doing analysis, which is simply invariant. You will get that. So if you do descriptive statistics, I find just right clicking and doing descriptive statistics is a good way to check a field as you're working your way through it. So you can see here the field. Uh, called City just has uh, 476 values of the word Chicago and then three missing values. Do we really need that field? It's invariant. We don't need it. We can simply delete it. So we can delete that as a common one. Um, date of birth has has a lot of cardinal, what we call high cardinality in it. That means a lot of individual values which you're going to get. That can be that can be an issue, um, uh, but. If if it was, for example, a uh, a field that recorded something like um, uh, product type, let's say you have I've got, I deal with a lot of retail data, so you get product type comes in and you you analyze that field, and it turns out it's got you know four hundred and seventy six different product types. You can't really analyze that because it's just too many categories. So you would use a command like recode or something like that to try to group them together into a more natural. Uh, or a smaller, more aggregated version of the product type. Um, to help us identify a lot of these typical issues that we get, we've got a kind of secret weapon. Uh, if we go to data here and we go to validation, we can click on this little option here called validate data. Okay, so validate data 
try tries to tries to look for lots of common issues that people have with data, such as invariance. It would, for example, identify that the field uh, uh, city was invariant for us. It would identify that date of birth was was if it was a string field, it would identify it as a as, as something which had an awful lot of values. And generally speaking, what you've got to do is just simply add all the fields that you want to check into this analysis variables box here. And if you've got an identifier, like a, a customer ID or something like that, put that into the case identifier variables, because that will help you when it creates a little report for you. It'll help you work out which case the issue or the problem is with. And as you work your way through the different tabs across the top here, you'll see that there are some basic checks that it will that it will try out for you. So, for example, it will say, OK, look, I'm going to look for anything where the maximum percentage of missing values is 70 percent or something like that you can change that value to 90 percent and say okay i'm going to raise that if anything if you've got a field here where 90 percent of the data is missing i want to know about it or where you've got a, a field which is quite invariant where you know 90 95 percent of the cases all belong to a single category that's not terribly unusual it has to be said you will get situations like marketing data where you're looking at whether or not somebody responded to a mail shot and you know 99% of the people don't respond to a mail shot but it may be useful if you're if you've got quite a big data set and you're trying to find out which ones have uh, are, are kind of stuffed full of the same category which fields stuffed full of the same category you can say maximum percentage of categories of a count of one so these are as i say values which have high cardinality where you've got you know 90% of the of the records all are effectively unique and then you've got you know fields which are numeric fields in nature like salary or age or something like that where there's no variation where everyone's the same age the same same salary you also see it'll flag things like incomplete id so it'll, it'll look for anything where the id is missing because you've got an id field here and it says okay i'm going to check that and flag duplicate fields for you so it's going to flag duplicate ids now, when it does this uh, analysis for you, it it uh, creates some output, and the output is simply shown here in in this little output tab here. You can switch on different types of output, but this type of basic check here, where we're kind of running that, if I just run that and see what happens, to see if, if it finds any errors, any problems of our data. So it says, okay, there's three things here that come come to mind right away. First of all, you've got case number one, which happened to be right at the top here doesn't have an ID associated with it. So I just sort in ascending order of uh, sorry if, if I sorted if I sorted the data in ascending order originally and found that actually you can see we've got some errors here at the, at the bottom here as well. Let's say that should be case number 475 and we just need to add that on to the end. It's got all the other data in there. So we call it 475. Just give it a legitimate value. What else is it telling us? It's telling us that there's some duplicates in there. It says that um, you've got two duplicates, and these are cases of the case number 21 and case number 22. Um, uh, they both have the ID number 20. So if we scroll down here and we get to case number 20, there we go. So it's found two cases of the same ID uh, associated with it. All the values are the same except for this field gender here. This can happen sometimes where gender has been recorded using uppercase and lowercase so it's been inconsistent but the rest of the data is all all effectively the same well i could just get rid of one of these i could click on the header and simply clear that um, alternatively i could actually get it to to if i run the validate data again i could actually get it to save out the duplicate id for me um, and save out any uh, empty cases for me. That's what's up. So it'll create a little report for me. So go create these as fields. So here are the fields that have been created. It says okay. This is this is unique, unique, unique. This is duplicate. Here's saying group one, group two. It's saying these are duplicates here. So I could say I could sort these in order and say okay, okay. Show me the show me all the duplicates um, at the top here in descending order, and I could simply get rid of any duplicates at, at that point and clear them. And I don't need this field anymore. So again, if you've got multiple duplicates, here it's saying incomplete IDs. Did we get? We I think we we dealt with that one. So everything else is everything else is complete. And we do have a situation here though where it's saying empty cases. Are there any empty cases? Well, you may have noticed earlier on 
when I was when I was running my analysis that there were indeed some empty cases at the bottom. They had they had ID fields, but everything else was empty. That can happen sometimes when you're reading a file in, and it just runs on a little bit. It doesn't have any data at the end. They get read as legitimate rows, and of course, it's easy to either do it. You could do something like data select cases and delete anything which is coded as empty, which has the code one. So you'd say, you'd say if, you know, select case, if it's zero and delete anything that's empty, that would be an easy way to do that. Or you can just basically highlight them and delete them like that, and then go back to sorting your data in, in the correct order again. So you've got that. We don't need that empty case uh, indicator field anymore. So you know these are these are standard ways in which we could we could uh, we could identify problems with the data, and that's all through using data validation, validate data. But within validate data, I'm going to switch these checks off. There are other things we do above and beyond the basic checks that we've done. There, there are things called single variable rules. So single variable rules are a good way, they're really useful because they give you this, this little chart here where it's showing you a kind of image, a distribution, if you like, of, of the different fields. It's showing you, very importantly, minimum and maximums. Minimum maximums are a really easy way to spot anything which sticks out, you know, which, is, um, which, uh, which uh, shouldn't be in there. And one of the things I noticed, for example, is that we have a maximum value here, at least one, at least one case, has uh, apparently 115 years of education. And that's clearly an error. Somebody couldn't have 115 years of education. So you could define a rule to check for these things. So you could click on define rules here. And we could say, okay, let's call this one education check. And we could tell it what the minimum number of years of education. Let's say it's eight. And the maximum is something like 25, if we know what that is. And then click continue at that point. Um, if you then check down here it's a schoolboy error i've made this many times it doesn't look like it's 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 appeared but if you actually click on the individual field here's the education check and you could switch that on at that point and it would run an analysis on that bear in mind that it limits the cases scanned to 5000 to create these to create these this, uh, this kind of overview chart if you've you know if, if you if you want, you can simply switch that off and say rescan, make sure it checks everything. There's education again, education check. What about a logical relationships uh, where, you know, you've got somebody who's I don't know, recorded as male and pregnant or something like that doesn't make sense. If you go to cross variable rules, you can define rules where, uh, you know, there should be a logical relationship that should be preserved here. So um, we could we could argue somewhat dubiously but we could argue that you know the beginning salary should never be higher than the current salary now in reality of course that that, that could be the case because somebody could get demoted or they could end up going part-time or something like that let's assume it's on a pro rata basis if you like so we'll call the salary check something like that and we would need to create a rule which would which would fire if you know if it um if it didn't make sense. So I would say, okay, current salary, if current salary is less than beginning salary, then I want to know about that. I want you to fire that and tell me if there's any any cases where that, that condition uh, has been met. And I've hit continue at that point. There's salary check switched on. Bear in mind, this is quite important. If you save the file after this, it will save these rules in the file as well. Um, so, just be aware of that if you're if you're um, if you're running it again, you don't have to necessarily set, set them all up again. In the output, of course, it's going to give us a little report here, but we could ask it to save things like um, uh, 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 indicator variables that record all rule violations. So I click OK at that point and run that. Give me a little rule that says, "Okay, look, there's there's one violation for education check." And there's one violation for salary, beginning salary check. So I could say, okay, here's my extra fields here. And again, I could search down through them or I could just sort them in descending order. Here's my education check uh, field. This is one that's, uh, that's, that has, uh, has failed that. And of course, we can see it's got 115 years. We can assume that we've gone back and checked. And in fact, in reality, 
that person should have 15 years of education so we don't need that anymore and what about the salary check well it's again sort in descending order there's is somebody whose beginning salary was 33,000 but their current salary is 27,000 maybe it's legitimate and we've gone and checked maybe it's not and we can go and change it and change the value here and that's that done and obviously it's going to do this for any records that have, that have violated uh, that checking rule on that subject you should be aware very usefully within the validation you can see it says load predefined rules if you say load predefined rules what's that do if you click okay at that point and then go to validate data again. And if you go to, go to single variable rules check, you can see that it actually comes with a set of rules that allow you to check. So for example, check that the, the, a variable name, like uh, a variable name for the variable sex, for example, here it's gender. It should only have one character, for example. It shouldn't have like two characters. It shouldn't be male and M. Or you can have one for if you if you're using uh, you know a, a a truncated version of day of the week for T U E for Tuesday and W E D for Wednesday and that sort of stuff. You can have it check that month three characters. Or it's a U.S. system, so you can have U.S. Data, make sure that U.S. states are correctly uh, formatted with the two character abbreviation or the full name. Very useful if you're working in the UK, UK postcodes, and if you're using UK social class designation to make sure that. That, um, that, that none of none of the values in the field recording UK social class or UK postcodes uh, violate um, violate the formatting of that. So very useful to know that you've got these these predefined rules that you can that you can actually just call up and apply uh, to your existing data set. Okay, something that we we noticed earlier on, and this is again a very common issue. It happens when people or different systems have been recording information slightly differently. We have a variable here called gender. And if I do an analysis of it, you'll notice that we have inconsistent coding. SPSS treats string characters, whether they're uppercase or lowercase, as separate, as separate values. So they're actually separate values. So here we can see that three times F for female has been record, re recorded as uppercase and male has been recorded as lowercase and uppercase, up, uppercase five times, okay? There's lots of different ways in which you can get away, away with that. Uh, so what's the ways you can deal with that? You could, for example, go to transform compute and you could overwrite the field using uh, a command. There's a command here called upcase. Uh, which you could use upcase allows you to somewhere in here yeah upcase converts everything to uppercase so it could make all the lowercase m's uppercase m's and make them consistent or or lowercase so you could do the opposite and make them all lowercase and um, or an alternative approach is to use transform recode into the same variables i tend to use this one for that particular situation where i can take the variable gender and i can say look if you've got a capital m just make that a lowercase m, add that. You've got uppercase F, make that a lowercase F, add that. Hit continue and click OK. It should have recoded them. Let's see if it's worked. Right click, run descriptive statistics, and now you have F and M. And then you might at that stage say, right, now I'm going to attach some value labels to this. Again, value labels, if you, if you haven't done this before, we did this in the previous Previous webinar, we're showing how to format data. Value labels are a way for us to, to label up codes. And again, there is syntax. The syntax, as you can imagine, for for value labels is simply the the word, uh, the phrase value labels. And it would be followed by the name of the field and then the code and the labels in quotes. And as you can see here, once I've got the value labels switched on, I can switch these on and off. And now when I do an analysis, that's been correctly formatted. There's also one for variable labels. You can see here the label here is gender. I could give I could make that a bit more descriptive and make it, you know, gender of employee. Again, there is there is syntax that allows you to do that. Okay. And on the subject of syntax, I have a syntax file that pretty much does exactly what I've I've just covered here is my data cleaning syntax. How do we how do we get to this uh, create the syntax? Well, sometimes we're having to type it in. You know, we're typing in words like rename variables or variable level missing values. Sometimes sometimes you just have to type it in because there isn't what we call a paste button 
But very often, as you'll see here in um, Validit Data, you can actually just hit paste, and that any any things that you switched on here, any changes that you've made, any any commands that you set up, it will simply paste the syntax for you. And that's again the same with recode anything with a dialog box. You can usually paste the syntax for it, so you can build up a report. So if you're reading data on a regular basis that needs to be cleaned on a regular basis, you can you can record all of that through uh, through syntax. So here's here's some here's my earlier syntax. I'm just going to get rid of that syntax window. Then I'm going to get rid of the output window and get rid of that. And then I'm going to show you the syntax I was working with here. You can see it starts by getting the original file employee for cleaning is what it was called. And if I hit file new here, it'll just get rid of that. It'll dump this file and say, do you want to save it? I say, no, I don't want to save it. We've got a blank data set. What's the syntax going to do? Well, it's going to read the file. It's going to rename var001 to job cap. It's going to set the variable label salary to scale. It's going to attach the minus nine as a missing value to, to the variable age. It's going to change job type to a numeric field. F, believe it or not, means numeric. That stands for floating point numeric. So this means it's going to change it to a number field where it can uh, store a three-digit variable. And I'm going to change the level, the level, the level of measurement from nominal to scale. And then I've done some date and time wizard stuff here where it, I've apply, asked it to change the date field to uh, the, the string date field to a date field. I've used the date and time wizard to do that because it allows me to paste the syntax for that. And then I've deleted the variable, deal, de, the original variable date of, date of birth and the variable city. And then I've removed the case with no ID field in it. There's one other one here I forgot about actually. If I If I just go back to the original data set, something very important, I'll just go back to the original data set, was I had a little a little uh, a little irrelevant value in my uh, my variable here job cap. I had one a variable a value which was irrelevant. And this of course is very, very common. If I do an analysis on that, you can see we've got three occurrences of intern. Okay, so what might I want to do with them? Well if you've got situations like that, you can just go to select cases. And go if if condition is satisfied and say if uh, employment category is not equal to okay if it's not equal to select it so that's what we're saying if you can't remember what the code is for intern you can right click on the field name say if it's not equal to four and select it and click continue and if I'm pretty confident that's going to work I could say delete unselected cases. And I could paste it for a syntax to run it again. If I click delete unselected cases and then run the analysis again, you can see that they've disappeared. They've been deleted from the data set. Obviously, do that if you're feeling confident. Otherwise, you can just go with the default, which would filter them out. But again, if I go back and just change this and say file new data, start with a blank data set, close down my output so that's gone. And then just run all of my syntax that I'd done earlier on and just run all the syntax. Run all. It runs all my syntax. It says some requested output is not displayed because all cases, variables, past requested checks. So it's just basically saying, look, you've asked me for some output here, but but the case uh, the the uh we didn't find any errors in the data that 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 met that. So it's just, that doesn't mean that it didn't run, that just means that it's saying that you know you've asked for certain types of output where uh, it wasn't a problem. And it's it's basically cleaned the data automatically for us and uh and over uh, it's it's got it's 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 got it's fixed all of the problems that we had earlier on. And we've recorded all of that through syntax. So syntax is is vital I would say to to working with uh, cleaning data if you're working with the same sort of data on a regular basis. If it's um if it's a one off uh, data set and you're doing it on a ad, ad hoc basis it may not be necessary to use syntax unless of course you want to to recreate a lot of repetitive tasks where you, you know you're going to delete a whole bunch of variables you're going to rename a whole bunch of variables you're going to recode a whole bunch of variables in which case it becomes very useful okay so uh just to finish up here you things that you should be aware of um we have uh we have a number of faqs that you can that you uh that you can find out uh, how how to do a number of of you know common common tasks that people want to 
want to uh, address things like how to merge files or change the language. We've got a bunch of video guides. We've got a, you know, hours and hours of, vi of video on our YouTube channel and from previous um uh, previous webinars we've got information on the spss software and we've got a we've even got a blog series on statistics and statistical testing um i'll just i'll just test uh, i'll just ask a couple of questions here so why not just remove the errant missing values we well, can remove errant missing values there's nothing to stop that um how do you get the syntax to automatically record the syntax automatically records anyway in the background um by uh, and it saves it in a in a away in a file for you. And if you go to uh, uh, edit options and you go to file locations, you can see something called the journal file here. This is the journal file, and uh, it calls it .jnl. If I just copy that and go to file, open syntax, and say open the journal file for me. Uh, oh, this one's got this. this oh, that's fine. It's got an unrecognized, uh, unrecognized identifier in it. But it, it's taken a while to open here because the journal file records everything that that copy of SPSS has done. I've had this copy of SPSS and I've been working on it for a while. So it will record everything. It'll take a while for it to open it up. And the reason why I wouldn't normally use the journal file is just because it records absolutely everything that you've done. Um, including your mistakes and things that you've done twice and three times. And you know, you don't normally want to. You don't normally want to see all of that junk. Uh, it's there as a kind of a safety, uh, a safety net for you to, to go back, and say, okay, look, the system shut down unexpectedly or something like that, and I've been working on it. I just want to scroll down to the last, you know, the last few things that I've been I've been running and and uh, and rerun them again. So I would I would recommend that you explicitly, um, in this case, you can see it's taken a while to open it here. It's only a text file, but still. It started started recording in fifteenth September um, two years ago, so it's sort of, you know it's got a lot of different syntax in there. It took me a while to scroll down through it, so I wouldn't recommend you do that. I would recommend that you explicitly save your syntax using using the paste button. So yes, a lot of additional resources that may, might want to watch uh, look out for. We've also got online training materials which are free to Smart Vision customers or available for purchase for non Smart Vision customers if you want to learn about all the stuff. And of course, we have a range of consultancy services and training services, whether it be one to two days or whether it be a much more involved uh, engagement. Um, we can help with sourcing your analytical software, often with discounts, especially SPSS software. You can buy it directly from us online. And we offer training and consultancy services, whether it be side by side, sitting with you and working with you or doing more formal training in-house or uh, over uh or over, over over the web, if you like, um, and we uh, and we offer no strings attached technical and business advice relating to all things analytical activities, whether or not you're a customer for us or not. We also offer formal technical support services for our own customers around the SPSS product line, and we do that in the formal uh, with ticketed technical supports. We're usually quite responsive to that because we're obviously we're experts in the software. And we're a small organization, so we can usually turn around queries and we're a lot pretty easy to deal with. I do hope that you find that useful and we look forward to you logging in again. In the next session, we're going to be looking at uh, running linear and logistic regression with SPSS statistics. So if you're interested in that, by all means, uh, register for that session. Uh, that's on, I think, at uh, three o'clock uh, and we'd love to uh, see you log in again. Thanks very much and look out for our forthcoming sessions, which you'll find out about on our website. Thank you.